Hello, in this video, I hope to do a comprehensive review of what primary care practitioners need to know about breast imaging, whether they're OBGYNs or family practice or internal medicine. In this video, I'm going to cover screening mammography, diagnostic mammography, breast ultrasound and breast MRI, as well as procedures, and then a little focus on the end about imaging the pregnant patient. So on to my learning objectives. By the end of this video, um, the viewer should be able to compare and contrast common screening protocols, identify and refer patients appropriately who need diagnostic breast imaging, distinguish patients who would benefit from breast MRI, explain to patients how diagnostic exams and breast procedures are performed, and then manage pregnant patients who have palpable masses. Before we launch into screening mammography, I just want to show you a graph you may well have seen before about breast cancer incident with age and just how much it starts zooming up. Um, and just notice there's no sort of real threshold. So whether you're following a protocol that says screening start at 40 or screening start at 50, you know, there's no magic change. It just gradually increases through age. So let's start with screening mammography. So who should we refer for screening mammography? Well, they should be asymptomatic patients, and that's super important. Um, our standard views are bilateral medial lateral obliques and bilateral cranial caudal views. We'll go over those in a few minutes. The age they should start is between 40 and 50, and we'll talk more about that. Um, and there is really no clearly defined time that um, patients should stop having screening. And again, we'll talk more about that. Uh, the frequency should be either annual or biannual. Now you can't be either a member of the public or a medical professional without knowing that there are a lot of controversies surrounding breast screening with mammography. And what do these controversies um, center around? Well, we're always trying to balance risk with benefit with any type of screening paradigm. So the risks are of radiation exposure, the risk of having biopsies, the anxiety it's produced um, versus the benefit. Um, there's no question, there's a lot of evidence of this, that annual from the age of 40 produces the greatest decrease in death rates overall. Um, but again, you have to balance that risk and benefit. Mammography produces about a 30% decrease in mortality. And in fact, some new modeling data suggests it's closer to 40%. And not only decrease in mortality, but um, early diagnosis decreases morbidity. They may not need chemo. They may have much less extensive surgery and so on. Now callbacks, which are basically when we are reading the screening mammogram and we need to call the patient back for additional images, have knock-on effects. They cause patient anxiety. Um, they produce, um, they induce radiation exposure, and obviously they cost money. If this then results in a procedure that costs more money, um, some patient discomfort, and more patient anxiety. Now, one thing to note that mammographic screening is monitored by the federal government far more acutely than pretty much anything we do in radiology. In fact, probably more than anything else in medicine. Um, so MQSA, which is the Mammographic Quality Standards Act, um, is what we use to guideline and it monitors radiologists, technologists, the equipment, the images, the radiation dose. So we are super closely monitored. Um, and we have to keep within very tight guidelines. Um, callback rates are generally between five to 10%. So if, you know, if your patient has mammograms for 10 years, they're probably gonna be called back at least once. About 10% of callbacks end up being a biopsy and then about 25 to 30% of those biopsies are malignant. Um, a number of different patient studies um, of surveys of patients show great acceptance of callbacks and they would rather have those callbacks than be concerned about getting breast cancer. I think it's good to have some kind of an idea of what the radiation exposure is um, for mammography. Some patients are very worried about this and you know it, radiation exposure obviously does occur. So the radiation dose is about six, the equivalent of uh, for a routine screening mammogram about six weeks of background radiation. After the age of about 40, breasts are relatively insensitive to radiation. They're not completely insensitive, but they, they are relatively insensitive. 
Um, and as the uh, patients get older, their breasts get less and less sensitive. Um, teenagers, conversely, their breasts are super sensitive to radiation. So we want to really um, reduce the radiation exposure to teenagers. There are various calculations out there of benefit to risk ratio in life years saved. And it's a pretty high number, it's 78 to one. So, you know, the risk is very small. The potential benefit is really quite big. Um, so, and just to give you some sort of figures, because sometimes the, these numbers are difficult to put in, um, for one full mammographic series, screening mammogram series, at age 60, for every um, 100,000 women, the 1,200 cases of breast cancer that are expected in those women increases to 1,202 from the radiation. Now, this has never been proven in practice. Um, this is theoretical calculations, which are basically based on uh, the radiation exposure of um, atomic bomb victims and some other high dose um, radiology exams. So, uh, you know, th this is probably a worst case scenario. Now, one of the challenges in advising patients about screening mammography is there are a number of different protocols. And I've just shown you some of the most common ones here, but I realize there are other ones out there. Um, and they really range from annual age 40, which is the American College of Radiology, ACOG, and the National Cancer Institute, um, to ones where it's biannual beginning at age 50. Now, the US Preventative Services Task Force, um, this is in 2024, is got draft recommendations to start at age 40, but biannual. Um, those are still under discussion at the moment, and I don't have that updated information for you at the moment. It's even more challenging when thinking about when mammography should stop because there are no randomized studies of involved patients over about the age of 70. So uh, the recommendations again vary between organizations. Some say stop at 70, which I think is super premature when we have you know, a very fit older population uh, or at least a subsection of it to over 80 years. And really the important thing is patients underlying health. If their life expectancy is under five years, screening is unlikely to be helpful. If they have severe underlying comorbidities, it's unlikely to be helpful. So, you know, dragging your patient who has metastatic colon uh, cancer to have a screening mammogram, even if they're age 65 or 70, is probably not going to be fruitful. On the other hand, if you have a super fit, 83 year old who you know is active they are, have a life expectancy of more than five years um, and screening should continue in that group i just want to briefly go over some of the important terminology that we use in our breast reports that um, the primary care practitioners need to know the most important part of this is the birads category so um, we follow the american college of radiologists BIRADS, which are, um, you don't need to know what it stands for, but basically we categorize every mammogram between BIRADS 0 and BIRADS 6. And it's important to know what these mean. So BIRADS 0 means is what we would call a do on a screening mammogram where we need to have additional images. So it's an incomplete one. Um, and we don't know the risk of malignancy at that point. Uh, BIRADS 1 is negative and BIRADS 2 is benign, are effectively zero risk of malignancy. BIRADS 3, which is called after you've done initial diagnostic exams, is probably benign, short interval follow-up, usually six weeks, but not always. And the risk of malignancy should be less than 2% for these. BIRADS 4, sometimes split into 4A, B, and C, um, with A being less suspicious than C. Our suspicious abnormalities should consider biopsies. Usually it means, you know, virtually always that means biopsy is going to be done. Risk of malignancy is very wide, 2 to 95%, which is why some people break this down to A, B, and C. BIRADS 5, highly suggestive malignancy greater than 95%, and category 6 is a malignancy that's already been biopsied. The other import of lingo is the breast density, and we're going to talk more about this. So um, these are split into four different categories, fatty, scattered, heterogeneously dense, and extremely dense. 
Um, sometimes these are called birads A, B, C, and D. As of um, September 2024, per FDA uh, ruling, all patients will be informed of their breast density and the potential for increased risk. So this is going to invoke a lot more questions to providers um, as these patients can be concerned what they need to do. Here's some examples of breast density. So this patient is fatty, this one is scattered, this one is heterogeneously dense, and this is extremely dense. So why do we care about this? Well, as the density increases from fatty to extremely dense, the risk of malignancy increases fourfold and the sensitivity of mammography decreases. So patients who have extremely dense breasts are really at a double, have a double whammy. You know, they're more likely to get breast cancer and we are less likely to pick it up. These four categories are often split into two groups, the not dense group and the dense group. And the dense breasts take up about 50% of the patient population. So this is really a significant number. There are, however, other factors aside from breast density, which increase your risk of malignancy family history, obviously, especially premenopausal first degree relatives. There's not only BRCA1 and 2 mutations, there are many, many other genetic mutations, many being um, identified every single year, which increase um, the likelihood of you getting breast cancer. Radiation to the chest when young, so um, particularly that for lymphoma to the mediastinum. If you've had atypia, such as atypical ductal hyperplasia, or a typical lobular hyperplasia on a prior biopsy. And then there's a group of patients who have Ashkenazi Jewish heritage, and they are definitely at increased risk. So how do we decide a patient if a patient is low risk or high risk? Well, um, there are a number of different online risk calculators. Some are simpler than others. Um, the two most commonly used are the Gale model and the Tyracusic model. Um, I prefer the Tyracusic models because it does include breast density. It's a little bit more detailed. Um, however, if they have a complicated um, high, uh, family history, for example, some of those other risk factors we talked about, you should probably refer them to a familial cancer um, clinic for them to have a better evaluation and possibly genetic analysis. Lifetime risk categories are usually split into three different levels. Um, the average woman has a less than 15% um, risk of malignancy of developing breast cancer during her lifetime. 15 to 20% is considered an intermediate risk and greater than 20% high risk. And it's that group in particular that we have to really think about using additional screening modalities. So what do we do for high risk screening? Well, if your first degree relative or your patient's first degree relative has breast cancer, then screening should start 10 years before that relative developed breast cancer, but no earlier than 30. So if a patient's mum got breast cancer at 45, she should start mammographic screening at 30. You should also consider breast MR screening done um, either annually or biannually in addition to mammography. And note, this is not in place of mammography because there are certain um, types of breast cancer, such as low-grade DCIS, which will be more visible on mammography than it will on MRI. But overall, there's probably at least a three times increased risk, uh, uh, increased detection rate of malignancy in high-risk patients for breast MR compared to mammography. An alternative to breast MR is whole breast ultrasound. Um, it, it is an option, but it is generally considered to be inferior. Now, how about if they have dense breasts, but no other additional risk factors? So they're probably going to fall into that kind of um, 15 to 20% um, lifetime risk. Well, you want to ensure they have annual mammography with tomography, not biannual, and it should start at 40 ideally. Um, breast MRI is an option in these patients. However, um, depending on your state, insurance may not pay for breast MRI just on the basis of breast density. Um, abbreviated breast MRI, which is a, we'll talk about um, a little bit further on, which is usually uh, self-pay in this situation for a, a reduced rate, um, is offered by many centers, including our own. 
whole breast ultrasound is again a, another alternative in these dense breast patients. We don't do that at my institution, Dartmouth Hitchcock, um, but they do at other some other institutions. And this may be automated or manual, and we'll talk more about that when I talk about breast ultrasound. I just want to talk briefly about transgender patients, where, which are increasingly large population um, for us to manage. Now, a transgender male, so a patient who has uh, was originally um, female without top surgery, you follow the cis female protocols. So, you know, annual or biannual age 40. If they've had top surgery, so they've had bilateral mastectomies, um, they have no imaging, but they should have regular clinical examinations because uh, they can never remove all of the breast tissue and they are some at, still at small, um, but not uh, zero risk of getting breast cancer. For transgender females, so originally biologically male patients, if they have been on hormones for more than five years, they should have annual mammography. They are at increased risk of having breast cancer. Um, there is no real good evidence of when this should start. I certainly wouldn't start this um, before the age of 30. Um, but, you know, there's no controlled randomized trials on these patients. We also don't know when they should stop. I'm just going to talk a little bit about mammographic technique. It's uh, really important that providers have an idea how mammograms are done because patients have, um, you know, a not small amount of anxiety frequently. They've heard some bad things. They've read too much on the web. So I said that two different views are done. We do MLOs of each breast and we do a um, CC. So this is a right medial oblique view. And you can see here that the uh, compression paddle is placed parallel to pectoralis. It's about 45 degrees um, from the vertical plane and the breast is compressed. And we'll talk more about breast compression in just a sec. Now, how much does this breast compression hurt? It's really variable. Um, it's not my funnest couple of minutes of the year, I have to say, um, but the compression is really on for you know less than a minute, um, and most patients tolerate it quite well. Some patients find it extremely painful, have very tender breasts, um, but it is super important. The second view we obtain of each breast is the cranial caudal view. So this is a straight up and down view. And by doing these both, view, both of these views, we maximize our visualization of all the breast tissue. So why do we do that squeeze? This is why it's important. It significantly reduces the radiation dose to the breast by making it thinner, so less absorption of radiation. It keeps the breast very, very still um, so it reduces motion and motion will really um, affect the sensitivity of mammography for picking up things like fine breast calcifications and it reduces the overlap of tissues again letting us have a better look at the tissues. Now what is the difference between 2D mammography and 3D mammography? Well uh, mammographic images were 2D when they were screen film and the original digital mammography and this literally is like a AP in a lateral chest x-ray. Uh, we're, we're turning 3D data into a 2D image. 3D mammography or tomosynthesis is a technique that allows us to obtain a series of slices through the breast, kind of similar to a CT, slightly different technology, uh, and that allows us to have a, a better look at the breast layer by layer. The majority of mammograms that are currently performed include both 2D and 3D images. In some centers, such as my own, we acquire a separate 2D image. In other centers, they may use uh, 2D images synthesized from the 3D data. So why, why do we do tomosynthesis? Why do we do 3D mammography? Well, it increases the sensitivity. It decreases the callbacks. But it does double the radiation exposure if you acquire that additional set of 2D images. As I said, however, that tomosynthesis can be converted into a synthetic 2D mammogram, which um, has the potential to decrease radiation exposure. Um, there is mixed acceptance of these in the breast imaging community. I'm not a sort of total fan of it, to be honest, because I think that we lose um, resolution for identification of a number of different things that we look for on the mammogram. Um, but some people really like them. They are improving all the time and I'm sure eventually this is what we will go over to. 
So how do we perform these 3D mammograms? Well, the patient's breast is in compression, the same as it is um, for the 2D imaging, only instead of the tube just sort of staying right at, above them, perpendicular to the breast like this, it's going to swing over. And it takes a series of images. That number can be between 7 and 15, depending on the um, different manufacturers. And then that data is reconstructed into all these planes or slices through the breast. Can we image patients with implants? Yes, absolutely we can. Um, implants, uh, however, produce some challenges. You can imagine, you know, here's a patient with a, a dense silicon implant where well, we can't see squat there. So we obtain a uh, double set of images in these patients. They have the regular set, um, which are these ones. And then we have an additional set of images which are called implant displaced or Eklund views. And the technologist literally holds the implant back and squashes the breast anterior to it. In some patients, you can image a lot of their breasts like that. In other patients with very little native breast tissue, um, we don't see um, that much breast tissue. And as you can imagine, these can be um, quite challenging to perform and they absolutely will decrease our sensitivity for detection malignancy if patients have implants. Patients often get very concerned about the implants rupturing um, what if they're going to have a mammogram. Now, this is reported, but it is extremely rare. Um, I can't remember the last patient we had this happen to at my institution. Um, I couldn't, however, find a reliable figure in the literature to how often it is, but extremely rare. So let's just have a quick look at some of the things that we look for on screening mammograms. And these are broadly calcifications, masses, architectural distortion, asymmetries, and lymphadenopathy. Let's have a look at some calcifications. These are two different patients. Let's look first at the patient on the right. If I zoom up here, you can see they've got lots and lots of calcifications in their breast, but these are round. Many of them have lucent centers, and these are what we call oil cysts. Uh, they can arise spontaneously, but we also often see them um, as a response of the breast to trauma. Now let's look at the other patient. You can see these calcifications are very different. For one thing, they're localized into a uh, segment of the breast following a ductal distribution. They're much finer. They're varying um, shapes and sizes, so-called pleomorphic. And some of them are actually quite linear. So we always worry about lines uh, when we see them in the breast. And these were DCIS, a biopsy. Now let's look at a couple of patients with breast masses. This patient on the uh, right side here has multiple masses, lots and lots of masses, but they're oval. They're either partially, they're either well-defined or obscured by the breast parenchyma. And this is a patient who has multiple cysts. So this would be a BIRADS2 mammogram. The patient on the left, however, has a solitary mass sitting here in the medial breast tissue. And you can see this is not clearly defined. This has got little kind of spiculated borders in it. And that is a little invasive ductal carcinoma. Now let's talk about architectural distortion. This is a little bit more difficult to describe than calcifications and masses. But architectural distortion is when you're seeing the tissue kind of pulled into itself. You imagine sort of grabbing a piece of material and, and twisting it. Um, that's kind of what you're seeing. So you can see here that we have these lines radiating into maybe a little mass in the middle, and that's architectural distortion. And this was biopsied, and this was shown to be an invasive lobular carcinoma. Um, there are benign causes of um, architectural distortion as well as malignant ones. And this is the same patient after they've had their cancer excised, and they still have architectural distortion there, but in this case, it's due to surgery. Asymmetries in the breast are just as they describe something you see in one area of the breast, but not on the other side. Um, so this is these are two different patients. The image on the left has this big glob of tissue here. They didn't have that on the other side. Um, in this case, this was just benign asymmetric parenchyma. It was just the way she was made. On this patient on the right, however, they have this little asymmetry. It was only seen on the right CC view, so we can't call it a mass. Um, and it's sort of got ill-defined borders. It's sort of, it's an asymmetry. It's not clearly defined mass. Um, and this one was an invasive ductal carcinoma. So 
asymmetries, like everything else, can be benign or malignant. Let's move on to talking about diagnostic mammography. There are, so there are several groups of patients who need diagnostic breast imaging. So, you know, it's done completely separate from screenings. Um, in our institution, it's actually in a, a totally different area. Um, but these images are always seen by a radiologist at the time of imaging, which usually they're not for screening. So patients who have clinical signs or symptoms in their breasts, they have a palpable mass, nipple discharge, focal pain, non-resolving mastitis, they all need to go to diagnostic mammography. By definition, patients who are by red zeros, so call back from screenings, um, are, go to diagnostic mammography, as do those who are by reds three for short interval follow-ups. I want to talk a little bit about breast pain because this is an extremely common problem and actually sort of sucks up quite a lot of our diagnostic imaging time. It's important to distinguish here breast pain or tenderness and a painful or tender breast mass. So mass or not mass. I'm only talking here about patients who do not have palpable masses. So if they have focal, which we count as one finger pain and tenderness, then you should order diagnostic mammography and ultrasound. If their pain is generalized, it's a whole quadrant, they kind of move from one place to another, it's bilateral, um, do their screening mammogram if it's due, if not, just reassure the patient, but they do not need diagnostic breast imaging. If their pain is waxing and waning, coming and going with their cycle, screening mammography if, they're, if it's due in their appropriate age, otherwise just reassure the patient. And even in patients who have focal pain, the incidence of malignancy is extremely small. I can't remember the last one that we had it in, in a patient who didn't have a mass. Um, it's zero to one percent, depending on the study you look at. So what is diagnostic breast imaging? Well, this is where all the fun starts. So we may do the standard MLO and CC views, usually with tomosynthesis synthesis, if they've not already been performed. We can do spot compression views. I'm going to show you these, all these views in a minute. Magnification views. We have other special views we can do. We may do focused ultrasound, and there may be a role for breast MRI. Um, as a general rule, if the patient is um, under 30, for a palpable mass, we do an ultrasound first and often an ultrasound only. If they're over 30, we do a mammo first and then do ultrasound. If the patient is presenting with a palpable mass within a few months of having had a normal screening mammogram, we usually do not repeat the mammo. We go straight to ultrasound. So here's just some of the 2D examples from additional images. On the left, we have a magnification views, which are being obtained of calcification, so we can get a better look at them here. On the right is a spot compression view, so we take a smaller paddle and we squish on it really hard, and that separates tissue out. And we do these commonly looking at abnormalities we've seen on screening mammograms, um, masses are going to stay and uh, just overlap of tissues is going to squish out. Here's a couple of the additional views. Uh, we commonly acquire a view of the axillary tail of the breast to obtain more visualization there. And sometimes these are done as part of the screening uh, mammography series. We may obtain a true lateral, either medial lateral or lateral oblique view, which is with the um, detector um, vertical like this. You remember last time for screening, it's at 45 degrees to um, about 45 degrees along the line of pectoralis, so it's more bleak than that. And that again, just gives us another view of looking at abnormalities. This one's a cleavage view. Um, we want to look at more medial tissue, particularly in patients who have larger breasts. And this is a tangential view, which is commonly done on palpable abnormalities that just really puts the palpable abnormality, there's a little BB marking the spot, right on the edge of the breast tissue. So let's move on to breast ultrasound, which is very commonly done at the time of diagnostic mammography or um, by itself. What do we use this for? Where if anyone has a palpable abnormality or focal pain, we're going to do it. We do it when we see a mass on the mammogram to differentiate solid masses from cysts. 
if we have a patient who has mammographic abnormalities such as asymmetries or architectural distortion or they have an abnormality on a screening MR we're going to use ultrasound to evaluate it patients with nipple discharge particularly if it's bloody nipple discharge patients who have mastitis that's not resolving we want to look at an abscess evaluation of axillary nodes either palpable or visible on uh, mammograms or MRs and then to guide biopsies and needle localization procedures so here's some examples of some uh, a couple of different masses on the left we have a hypoechoic means it has less echoes than the surrounding glandular tissue mass that's irregular and it shadows posteriorly it's blocking the sound waves there and this was an invasive ductal carcinoma on the other hand on the right is a patient who has multiple cysts they're well defined they're anechoic and they have increased through transmission so more ultrasounds going back through them because of the fluid in the cyst Diagnostic breast ultrasound is always uh, manual. In other words, there's a technologist or there's a radiologist who um, has the ultrasound probe and is scanning the breast. Um, but it can also be automated. There are certain automated gadgets and these are used for screening. Um, they're not used for diagnostic exams. So this is just one example of it. And the text just going to place this device over the breast with some kind of a jelly or jelly pad below it and it's just going to kind of do its thing and screening whole breast ultrasound does increase the sensitivity of cancer uh, identification in dense breasts it does unfortunately have high false positive rates um, if it's manual it's very time consuming there is a significant intra um, observer variability and it is limited in larger breasts where you get less good posterior penetration um, the automated one may not work for it um, MRI is much more sensitive than screening whole breast ultrasound so what do we need to know from you as the primary care practitioner as you are referring um, your patients to diagnostic breast imaging we need to know if they have had a breast cancer before or they have a family history of it and if they have had it what treatment they had if they have signs or symptoms we need to know which side what clock face I'll show you an example of that in a minute how big it is and how far from the nipple this is super important as you can't believe how many patients we see where they don't know where the doctor detected something and they just kind of vaguely wave their hand around the press we are going to be much better at identifying abnormalities if we know where you felt something if they have nipple discharge we need to know what color it is is it unilateral or bilateral and is it spontaneous or only when the patient squeezes their breast so when I'm talking about clock face or radium what do I mean well just imagine each breast as being a clock notice that the left breast the lateral breast tissue is three o'clock the right the lateral breast tissue is nine o'clock and just tell us on which radian this is so this one's going to be about five o'clock we also need to know the distance of the nipple. Now note, this is not the distance in the edge of the areola, but it is the distance from the center of the nipple to the center of the lesion. Let's move on to our next breast imaging modality now, breast MRI. There are a number of different indications for doing breast MRI. Non-enhanced studies are looked for the integrity of silicon implants high risk screening in patients who are increased risk of breast cancers we discussed before staging in newly diagnosed breast cancer we pick up about 15 percent uh, in about 15 percent of patients we will pick up an additional malignancy of one or other breast the evaluation of bloody nipple discharge in patients who um, have had a mammo and an ultrasound which has been uh, non-contributory Patients who have metastatic adenocarcinoma to the axilla who have um, been worked up with mammography and that has been negative. Um, so in other words, we've not found the source of it. And then there's a limited um, diagnostic use. Um, sometimes we just can't sort the problem out by mammography and ultrasound. Um, so like, for example, patients who we are suspect on some form of imaging that there is a local recurrence at a prior lumpectomy site and in patients to evaluate for Paget disease 
um, looking for the site of tumour in the breast who have had, again, negative mammography. So who should be you should you consider referring for breast MRI for high risk screening? Um, now um, MR is greater than 95%. Some people say as high as 98% sensitive for uh, detecting cancer in these patients. So those who, that have greater than 20% lifetime risk, either on the basis of the gene mutations, strong family history, some combination of family history and density, chest radiation under 30, or history of atypia. How do we do this? Well, if we are looking for malignancy, we give gadolinium. If we are looking for implant rupture, um, we don't. The patient is lying prone. Their breast kind of falls uh, into a special coil. The exam takes around 25, 30 minutes. Uh, we take images before and after contrast. We acquire some special sets of images, including subtraction images and maximum intensity projections. I'll show you these in a sec. And, and we can do kinetic analysis on the flow of gadolinium in and out of the breast. So this is a MIP, a maximum intensity projection of a patient who has uh, Paget disease in the right breast. Remember, that we always look at these things upside down. So uh, you can see this asymmetric uptake in her right nipple compared to her left nipple. And then she has what's called non-mass enhancement within the right breast, which was her fairly extensive DCIS. Now, what is abbreviated breast MRI that I touched on earlier? So these, we do limited um, study sequences. It should take less than 10 minutes. And the indications are really um, those patients who have a sort of intermediate risk of breast cancer or have dense breasts with no other risks. Um, at our institution, this is self-pay, $399. And the sensitivity in most comparative studies is likely very close to that of a full breast MRI. Let me show you an example of this. This is a woman whose only risk factor was extremely dense breasts. As you can see here, here's her mammogram. It was performed a few months uh, prior to her abbreviated breast MRI, and it was negative. So we were really pretty surprised when we did her breast MRI, and this is without gadolinium, with gadolinium, subtraction, which basically means this image minus this image, just showing the areas of enhancement, and her MIP to see this, you know, really quite large three centimeter uh, breast cancer on her, which was biopsy proven uh, invasive ductal carcinoma. Most units also do a type of kinetic analysis um, or CAD. And this, in this, the software basically calculates the kinetic curves of how the contrast goes into and out of the breast on a voxel by voxel basis. And then it colorizes it depending on the curves. And this is just sort of so you know what we're talking about in our reports. We basically, you have the patient um, image before gadolinium, and then they have a series of um, usually three or four images taken after gadolinium. And we watch how that contrast goes in to the breast. Uh, we are more concerned about contrast that goes fast into lesion and fast out of lesions like washout than we are stuff that goes very slowly into the breast and just keeps going up, which normal breast parenchyma will do. I came across this on the web. I thought it was kind of funny um, how to remember the differences between them, that uh, washout, your Slytherin, your, your, your baddie curves, where your Hufflepuff is your persistent curves, and then Plateau, Ravenclaw, somewhere in between. Let's move on to just briefly describing some of the breast procedures that we can do. So we can do um, biopsies, core biopsies of the breast using ultrasound for guidance. Um, we have a variety of different ones we can do, 14 gauge and 18, 14 gauge is the most common. We can do smaller biopsies, 18 gauge sometimes, or we can do larger 12 gauge vacuum assisted biopsies. Stereotactic biopsies can be done in the patient upright or prone depending on the device. And then we can do biopsies using the vacuum device, the same one as we use for stereotactic in MRI. We frequently localize lesions for excision by the surgeon, virtually all after they've already had some kind of a, um, an image guided biopsy. Um, we may use a needle and wire system for this. Uh, this is uh, the most common, but increasingly frequently we are moving um, on to uh, placing little seeds. These seeds can be uh, produce radiation, be little radioactive seeds. They can be detected magnetically 
or they can produce a radio frequency. And all of these will have some kind of a, a gadget, depending on what type it is, that the surgeon will use in the OR to identify these seeds. When do we use what? Well, if we can see it by ultrasound, uh, we're usually going to biopsy it by ultrasound. It's cheaper, it's quicker, it's easier for the patient. Uh, may not necessarily be easier for us. Uh, if we can't see it by ultrasound, but we can see it on the mammogram, we're going to use a stereotactic approach. So most calcifications will be biopsied stereotactically. So using mammographic images for guidance. And if we can only see it on the MRI and not any other uh, modality, we will use the MR for guidance. And they tend to be the more complicated and expensive biopsies. The risks of a breast biopsy are very small. By far the most common is a hematoma. You know, you know, you would really have to work hard to lead a patient to death with these, but you can certainly give somebody a bad bruise um, or a sore lump afterwards. And very, very rarely a patient needs to go to the OR to have sutures in. I think I've been doing this for nearly 30 years and I've had one. Um, very rarely can they have an infection at their biopsy site. There is a little incision. Um, the pathologist might say they need more tissue, so a repeat biopsy. And then there is a mostly theoretical risk of chest wall trauma or pneumothorax, um, particularly from ultrasound guided biopsies. Um, in the 30 years I've been at this institution, there's been one incidence um, of this amongst all of the radiologists. And that was a resident. I just want to mention briefly about anticoagulation and the policies are going to be very institutional dependent. So um, these are ours. Um, there are, of course, risks of stopping anticoagulation and the risks of stopping anticoagulation, such as stroke, may be much greater than those of um, the patient having a, a more significant hematoma. Um, generally speaking, um, we continue with aspirin. Um, if the INR is under 2.5, we will usually just continue and do the biopsy um, if they're on Coumadin. Uh, Plavix plus aspirin is the greatest risk um, of bleeding, and the risk of bleeding in stereos and MRIs is significantly more in ultrasound, particularly because you can kind of put pressure on it easily with the ultrasound. And so we usually work with the patient's providers, um, pre frequently their hematology provider, to plan the specific patient management for any one individual patient. It may or may not require uh, bridging with Lovenox. Just to give you an idea of what these look like when they're being done, this is a prone stereotactic biopsy. So the patient's lying on the table, her breast come, comes through a hole in the table, and the radiologist is sort of working underneath the patient with this to do the biopsies. And these are nine gauge. This is an upright uh, tomographic guided biopsy. This is our current device. And although you'd think that it would be more uncomfortable for patients, most of them tolerate it extremely well. Um, it's much faster, so you can get sort of much faster imaging and through this, um, and that's really what contributes significantly to patient discomfort. They have to lie for a long time, and, and patients generally do not like lying on their bellies. Ultrasound-guided biopsies, I'm sure you're familiar with these for other things, so we're going to, you know, numb it all up, make a little nick, and then we have a variety of different specialized devices that we will take these biopsies under ultrasound guidance. Here's a couple of the devices we use for ultrasound. This is the Achieve needle. It's a 14 gauge needle. This is my kind of workhorse needle. Every radiologist has their own favorite, but this is, and this is mine. Um, and this is a, a vacuum assisted device that we use for certain type of lesions in the breast where we feel that it would uh, provide better sampling. This is a conventional wire, needle wire localization done on a little a clip from a biopsy. Um, so we're going to put a needle down into the breast using either mammogram or ultrasound for direction. Uh, we put a little fish hook wire in, take the needle out, and that stays there for the surgeon to identify the lesion, lesion at time of surgery. Um, this is the newer type localization. This is what's called a mag seed. This particular one's a mag seed. As I said, they can be magnetic, radioactive, or uh, radio frequency producers, and that is placed again by ultrasound or mammographically and is detected in the OR by the surgeon. The last section I want to start with is breast imaging in pregnancy and lactation. So first of all, it's important to know that mammography is safe in pregnancy and in 
lactation. Um, really, there is absolutely very minimal, if any, radiation dose whatsoever to the fetus. Um, if patients are lactating, we ask them to nurse or pump before they have imaging. Um, generally speaking, delay because it, the, the mammography is less sensitive in these patients because their breasts are so much denser um, and patients are not very enthused about having compression on lactating breasts. Um, delay screening unless they're going to have prolonged lactation or they're high risk. If they're high risk, you should still do it. Ultrasound is usually the first examination of you know, primarily palpable abnormalities in pregnancy, um, but it can also be for mastitis ruling, um, ruling out an abscess in the lactating breast. So what are some of the common things we see in pregnancy or lactation, mastitis and abscesses, I just said, galactoseals, lactational adenomas, which are basically a sort of form of fiber adenomas that tend to um, grow fairly rapidly in pregnancy or lactation. And then the one that we're all concerned about, obviously, which is pregnancy associated breast cancer. This is a patient with a galactoseal or a milk cyst. You can see here on the mammogram that it contains fat, it's radiolucent. And then it's produced this sort of well-defined mass with low-level echoes. And we usually don't do anything about those. They will resolve spontaneously. Every now and then we'll aspirate one for patient comfort. This is a patient who had a lactational adenoma. And you can see it looks kind of like a fiber adenoma. It's well-defined um, oval mass. It can grow quite rapidly. Um, and they usually spontaneously shrink or involute. Um, and this, by this patient, 15 uh, weeks postpartum, it was completely gone. Um, these do get, end up being biopsy during pregnancy, not infrequently. Um, some of the smaller ones we just follow up. And then this is a patient who has an abscess in their breast. Um, they were breastfeeding, had mastitis, didn't resolve, and ended up having a drain in. So pregnancy-associated breast cancer is defined as breast cancer during pregnancy to up to one year postpartum. And it's a very small uh, percentage of breast cancers, um, probably um, less than 3% of breast cancers. Um, but it is increasing as women tend to be having babies later in life. It's about one in 3,000 pregnancies. So, you know, rare, but not, you know, you're going to see some. Um, there tends to be a delayed diagnosis in these patients. So, therefore, they... Um, present with more advanced disease, and in fact, 40% of stage three and four by the time um, they present. Now, why do they present later? Well, you know, s some is thought to be due to increased blood and lymphatic supply to the tumors in the pregnant and lactating breast. Some is because their breasts are larger, they're difficult to palpate, you know, they have a lot of changes going on. There is some reluctance, I think, sometimes for practitioners to refer these patients for um, further evaluation by um, diagnostic breast imaging. When they look at the pathology of pregnancy associated breast cancer, um, the pathological features are very similar to other um, to early onset breast cancers in non-pregnant patients, um, a higher proportion of triple negative tumors, but also luminal B. Um, these can be treated in the second and third trimesters, and the treatment is um, very similar to that in the non-pregnant patient, including chemotherapy. MRI is contraindicated, however, in pregnant patients, um, gadolinium is contraindicated, um, which is the problem. We can do the, the MR, just not give the gadolinium. The prognosis tends to be generally worse than in non-pregnancy associated breast cancer, but this has been very much different studies and probably when they're matched for stage and age, um, it is actually similar. Now, what about doing biopsies in lactating breasts? There is unquestionably an increased risk of infection. Um, you know, it's a lovely sort of nice warm culture medium there. Um, so we really do uh, obsess about sterile procedure and so, such like in these patients. Um, we do get them to pump before um, they come in for whatever type of biopsy they're having because that's going to reduce the risk of it. Um, there is a small risk of a milk leak. Um, it's under 5% and those usually resolve spontaneously, but they can develop very rarely chronic milk fistulas. Um, the risk is greater with the larger needle you use and the closer to the nipple where you're more likely to be traumatizing big, bigger ducts. 
it is safe for them to continue nursing. Um, you know, obviously we do give lidocaine. Um, if you want to be ultra cautious, you could um, dump one or two feeds um, from that um, side of the breast, by which point the lidocaine has completely gone. Okay, that's all I have. I hope you found this useful. If it has any questions, feel free to post them in the comments. I hope you found this useful. If anyone has any questions, feel free to post them in the comments. Thank you.